All right, let's get started. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, this is a little bit of a different session. We're going to do a more of an informal chat, and uh, we're going to focus on the topic of cross-platform frameworks. Um, as, a, as, a, as we were selecting the DroidCon talks, we've seen a lot um, of uh, propositions on the cross-platform uh, talks. So it's definitely a topic that is hot at the moment, and it's not a new thing. I remember back in the day being a little bit scarred by the, the phone gaps and, and such, uh, of, yeah, which basically gave me a really bad image of cross-platform frameworks, but these days it seems like the solutions are evolving, and um, every single one of uh, the persons that are sitting here have a specific experience on a different framework, and so we're going to try to uh, dig in and uh, hopefully change my mind, my bad image that I have on cross-platform frameworks and maybe help me choose one. Um, so why don't we start doing a little, really quick intro. Um, tell everybody who you are, where do you work, and uh, what's, what cross-platform framework do you have experience with? Okay, uh, my name's Kevin Galligan. I am uh, president of a company called Touch Lab. We're like a mobile agency in New York. Um, I have been really not doing any client work or making any money for anybody for a while. I've just been doing Kotlin multi-platform and native libraries and researching and publishing and, and that kind of stuff. So that's, that's all I'm gonna talk about. I'm Gabriel Veal, and uh, I currently work at Tonal, but I spent three years doing Android and React Native at Airbnb. Hi, everyone. I am Ifoma Kirike. I am currently doing Android at WW, formerly known as Weight Watchers. I recently started doing Flutter, and I really like it. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Matthias Wenz. I work at Microsoft and Visual Studio App Center. And I got recently in touch with the Xamarin app that we used to build. Uh, and we moved away from Xamarin for that, for a real pure native Java Android application. Nice. So as you can see, we got uh, Kotlin native, React native, Flutter, and Xamarin. So four approaches for the same problem. Now, um, if you know, we, we can all go on the internet and read all great, like if you look at the individual websites, they all say it's all perfect and great and it just works. Um, but these guys actually built apps with it and uh, they have the experience also of building native apps so they can have a comparison. And so the first thing I wanna hear is maybe Let's not, we don't need to do intros on how it works. We can read it online. But what I want to know is, from your experience, what's your favorite thing about the platform? And what, what's the thing that you really hate about it? Um, so the, the Kotlin stuff is, is different uh, because it's not, I, um, it, I call it like optional code sharing that's natively integrated. So. Uh, and we don't say cross-platform just because the, the whole term has a lot of baggage associated with it. Um, but it, it, the, my favorite thing about it is really we're just trying to add efficiencies with shared logic and architecture to the point um, where it makes sense, but not try to have like a shared UI or do things that are, um, I would say, too difficult to do. So it, it meshes really well with the native that you're doing. So the DroidCon app, which you all have, presumably on Android and iOS, it shares... Uh, reactive architecture, SQLite database, you know, threading, logic, everything else. But once you get to the UI level, you know, on iOS, it's Swift just calling into it like any other framework. And on Android, there's nothing cross-platform. It's just a Java thing all the way down to the bottom. Well, a JVM thing in Kotlin. So it just lives natively really well in the ecosystem you're in. The worst thing is the tools like just got released. So for six months we were writing on like Notepad and trying to figure out like native seg faults and, and all sorts of crazy stuff. So it was really difficult. And the tooling still is like got a while to, to go. Like there's no, it doesn't break points, don't stop at a debug thing. You have to log, you know. It's, so it can be slow and, and the pace is slower than everyone would like, but they're working on it. Okay. So Kotlin Native sounds like the good thing about it is that it's 
it's like the closest thing to native, and the worst the the, the thing that I know is that it's too it's too green. Basically, there's not enough. Um, it's not mature. Can we summarize it like that? All right. What about React Native? What's your favorite thing about it? And also, maybe like it could be related to why why did you guys choose React Native? Yeah, so I, I would say that uh, the thing that I like about React Native the most is still the reason why we originally decided to use it at Airbnb, which is that it's React. React has proven itself at scale on the web. It's one of the most loved and appreciated frameworks that's ever permeated the developer community. I mean, people genuinely love it, and it works at scale. And it's continued to just grow over time, and its community is pretty amazing. Um, and then this worked really well at Airbnb because we had a huge lack of mobile resources and lots of web resources who had just uh, basically rewritten and continued to write the entire website in React. So I'd say that that's still absolutely the number one advantage that React Native has, is that it's just React. On the flip side of that, I would say that because it's trying to bridge a web framework into mobile, the, and you know, come with some of it could just be the specific implementation details of the way that it is today, but it generally works really well like 90% of the time. And then that last 10% of the time can be really challenging. There's a lot of moving pieces in React Native between the JavaScript core, React itself, Yoga, which we can talk about later, as well as the, the way that the view hierarchy works and the native libraries and open source. There's a lot of different pieces to the puzzle and things can go wrong and it can be really hard to figure out why or where or how to fix it. Um, so like my favorite thing about Flutter is the widgets. The on Flutter you have um, material design widgets and Cupertino widgets for um, Cupertino for iOS and then material design for Android. So I can build a Flutter app and it'll look like a native Android app or a native um, iOS app, and I don't have to I don't have to write that code. And and it's like um, I, the first time I started um, I'm writing Flutter code, it was like. I didn't even have to specify how my app bar looked or how like the text was centered or not centered on Android and iOS. And that was just like, that's just like one of the things I like about it. And another thing is like, it's really very performant and fast. If you've heard of um, like the hot reload feature where you can make um, a, a change to the code and just save it. And like in less than a second, you see that change on either your phone or the emulator or simulator. That's like another thing that will make you like develop your, your apps um, really quickly. Um, the downside about Flutter is that it's it's new and um, some of the things that you would want to uh, accomplish um, with Flutter may not really be available. So like some of, they may not have like the libraries that you need. Um, so for example, like they recently um, they recently released the um, the preview version of the Maps library. So before that, you would have to implement. Um, maps on Android and iOS if you had a Flutter application that needed to use maps. So like that, that's like one thing that um, you need to keep in mind if you're using Flutter. Uh, I think about Xamarin, the thing that I like the most out of like all the approaches that I've heard so far is like, uh, neutrally speaking, is probably most mature in the sense like it has been along, uh, along for the longest. Um, and uh, if somebody would have asked me a couple of years ago if I wanted to choose like a platform language that I would be using like across like different platforms, say like uh, I used to do a lot of Objective C, uh, Objective C, then I switched to Swift, then I switched to Java, and then I switched to Kotlin. Uh, it's actually worth giving C Sharp a go uh, because it really like you know it might not be to in, like entirely everybody's taste, but it like I feel like it combines a lot of great things about uh, the different languages. Um, the thing that I personally don't like about Xamarin the most is the tooling, in the sense that if you're not a Visual Studio person, and I'm certainly not a Visual Studio person in terms of the IDE, um, you will find yourself between a rock and a hard place. Like the Visual Studio for Mac doesn't appeal to a lot of people, and using Visual Studio uh, through Parallels, for example, or Fusion on a, uh, on a Mac <laughs> also is not really appealing to a lot of people. Got it. So. It sounds like each platform has you know, something that it's good at. Sounds like uh, Xamarin has like the maturity. It's been out for a while, so it probably has the most complete um, API set. Flutter seems really good at UI. That's at least how I see it from uh, externally. Um, but maybe it's lacking on the non-UI side um, and just maturity of APIs, like missing maps 
on a cross-platform framework for mobile apps, that's pretty, that's pretty rough. I know that they're adding it, but that shows that it's quite young. Um, React Native, it seems like, at least from uh, someone that doesn't know much about it, the best thing about it is that um, you can deploy your code um, remotely. And that's, that's something that I've, we've all been struggling with in native land. Um, you introduce a bug, uh, you want to update your app, it, like the rollout phase is, is so long. So it seems like uh, all the, these JavaScript frameworks try to solve it and React Native is the clear winner there. And Kotlin Native is kind of like the odd one out. It seems like it has everything because it is native, but um, it seems like you still have to do work um, to do the specific platform, uh, the, like something for a specific platform. Um, so, Matt, you mentioned a little bit about the tooling on, on Xamarin. I'm curious, um, and anyone can take the mic here, um, is any of these cross-platform frameworks nicer to work with in terms of tooling than native Android, Android Studio, Gradle, et cetera? Is there any improvements on the developer experience in any of the frameworks there? I would say that this was not as true while when we were doing React Native at Airbnb, but since we moved away from it, TypeScript support has gotten a lot better. And although it's hard to match the like how amazing Kotlin and IntelliJ are together, uh, the, I would say a second runner-up would be TypeScript and VS Code. Uh, it's an incredibly well-run project by Microsoft and the open source community, and they work super well together. Uh, and they're, they're just, it's a super powerful language. You can move really fast. Uh, it's more or less you get most of the typing uh, problems solved that people not commonly associate with JavaScript. Mm -hmm. It has a strong community with strong types for third-party libraries. And you also don't have to worry about compilation speeds. So even at our scale at Airbnb, where we had we had about 80,000 lines of JavaScript product code and 20 or 40,000 lines of JavaScript infrastructure. So you're talking about well over 100,000 lines of JavaScript. And the hot module reloading in React Native really worked. It super, super worked at that scale, and it worked reliably as well. Uh, so we were able to get you know, one or two second deploys on Android and iOS uh, simultaneously, in, like in practice, for real. Nice. And uh, Ifom, I know that Flutter has uh, hot reloading too. Uh, you mentioned that earlier. Yeah. How was it working with uh, Dart and uh, I guess uh, you work on Android Studio as well? Yeah, so um, you could use Android Studio, IntelliJ, or um, Visual Studio Code, or you could also use um, the command line if you want to. Um, and it's really great. I use Android Studio and it's been, it's been like, really easy to work with. Um, Dart has this thing where like when you're writing the app, you you add um, commas after your widgets so, so that um, the IDE knows to like um, auto format it. So that really works well when you save and it just auto formats it for you. Um, um, Flutter, there's also this um, Flutter inspector that um, comes with the IDE that you could um, click into um, into your app, a view in your app, and then it'll show you where that code is in in your code or in the um, widget tree. So that's really cool. I like that a lot. Nice, kind of a Chrome inspector before your Flutter app. That's yeah. cool. Um, what about Kotlin native, actually? What, is, what what's your uh, environment looks like for develop like pushing to multiple platforms and handling all that? So uh, the thing about Kotlin and multi-platform and native to understand is that. Um, it's not where it's at today, right? It's where it's going to be at in like six months. Because up until a few weeks ago, literally Kotlin Conf, everything was like coding in Notepad because nothing auto-completed. And now, um, it's, <clears throat> I guess my argument is like, is it where other things are at today? Not really. Do you think JetBrains is not going to get it there? Let's see, right? So it's a lot better now. It really understands when you need to do like the expect actuals. It understands what needs to be implemented. It's much better at code completion. Like it's night and day from where it was. Is it great? Uh, there are definitely some shortcomings. Like do you get automatic reload of code? Like uh, no, you don't. Not even close. But um, I do expect they're, they're going to get much 
like better at it. And certainly JetBrains, like that's their business is a, is a good developer experience. So yeah, they're definitely doing things right with Kotlin. So I mean, I have high hopes. Um, right now, at least it, from an uh, Android developer perspective that has been doing native for a long time, uh, Kotlin native seems like the obvious kind of transition because I already know Kotlin and everything. I don't have to learn a new language. I don't even have to change my IDE probably. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the, the support in the community around each framework because um, Android is now so mature that you can pretty much Google any problem, any bug that you have, and you're going to find a match on Google. It's gonna, someone is going to have uh, run into the issue before. Um, I know that Xamarin is probably the, uh, probably the oldest one of the four frameworks here. How's the community right now, and how good is the support um, in terms of when you have an issue, can I just Google it and I'll find it immediately? Is everything out there for me to find? I mean, um, in that sense, I'm kind of biased, I guess, because like you know, I have direct access to support in a, in a different way than most people out there would have. Uh, I have seen that the Xamarin community is also very active, uh, and there's a lot of people outside of the company Microsoft that are providing great uh, improvements and great support and uh, great you know community around uh, Xamarin as a platform. Uh, that is certainly also helped by the fact that like a lot of his writing on that .NET Core wave that we open sourced and that we get a lot of great contributions from the community from. Um, but yeah, I, like I said, probably biased here. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, about, uh, what about React Native? I know that the React community is huge, but how much overlap is there with React Native? Do you... Can you solve your problem with a React solution in React Native? Yeah, so you really do have to look at both sides of the coin with React Native, where I would say if you were to look at the package.json we had for the React Native at Airbnb, the vast majority of packages we had were just React Web. We used everything from Redux to Memoization, Jest, uh, Enzyme, uh, many, many other common libraries that you would expect to use, Redux Pack, whatever it might be, it just works. Like, it truly is React Web running on JavaScript core to power React Native. Now, some people might, they're going to they're gonna reel back when they hear that your code is running in JavaScript core, but fear not, it's actually pretty fast, and you do get all the benefits of working with the React Web community. And for that, it works pretty well. On the flip side of that, on the React Native side of the community, it's a lot smaller, and it's moving a lot faster, and when you find issues or problems, um, they generally have either very frequently React Native has moved on, whatever the API they're using is deprecated. Uh, at least a year ago, there were a lot of issues on the React Native GitHub where issues basically would never get triaged. And I know that they hired a couple people to really focus on the open source efforts on the React Native side. So I hope that things get better there, but it was a real challenge on the React Native side. In addition, the libraries, the open source libraries we found were also more challenging to work with on average. Uh, if you were at my talk earlier today, I talked about how a cross-platform library for React Native or any of the other libraries uh, are often writing for three platforms rather than one. And it's really hard to maintain perfect API compatibility, really high quality code, and canonical APIs across all three platforms. So you may have a library that was, uh, is great on Android but terrible on iOS or vice versa. And you also have the challenge where if you look at the Android or iOS community today, a lot of the top libraries we use were made by Facebook, Square, Uber, Airbnb, a lot of high quality, like a huge amount of institutional investment behind large libraries that are used by thousands or tens of thousands of apps around the world. But if you look at the same for React Native, it's generally like one guy somewhere made something. Uh, or on the flip side of things, we had a couple of you know, situations where uh, React Native didn't have a maps library when we started, and so we built one. And it turned out that that was really like the first one that anyone had built. And it also turns out that maps are super complicated. And it turns out that people want to do really crazy and very different kinds of things with maps. Yeah. So we built a little map library for ourselves, and then we open sourced it. But then because it was the first one, the entire community picked it up. And Facebook even started recommending that people use our map, React Native Maps library. And then we entered this interesting challenge where we were going to sunset React Native. We no longer have the resources to invest in it. And then you know, we're kind of stuck. Uh, and so in these cases, we actually ended up migrating our React Native libraries to uh, a repo or an organization called React Native Community. Um, 
And uh, for some repos, it's kind of where they go to die, unfortunately. But for for others, it's really it, it is kind of in a weird spot where you kind of have to rely on the community because you don't have the same kind of institutional investment at scale that you have with the Android and iOS. Um, one of the things that always um, kind of made me look badly on cross-platform frameworks is that as someone that follows um, kind of the en new Android versions that come out, the new APIs that come out, um, it seems like cross-platform frameworks are always behind um, the native. So take an example, like for example, on uh, Android 8, there was um, the pip support, right? Like minimizing your activity into a, a window that you can move. Does any of the crop platform framework has that feature yet? And that was like almost two years ago that they released that. So I know that, so I want to hear the Kotlin native side. And I know that of course in Kotlin native you can access um, all the Android APIs, but what about on the iOS side? How does that work? Well, I think it's important to understand like uh, the reason, the pro one of the primary reasons that I, I'm so focused on it and why we use it is because it's optional. Like if Kotlin native doesn't support some crazy new feature in iOS, it's okay, because you're rendering your UI in Swift or whatever you want to use. So it's not like you're locked into this, this thing, right? Now they do um, have interop that, that as they get new versions of Xcode, new versions of like whatever, the libraries that come out, they generate interop that you can call from Kotlin. But you don't need to code your UIs in Kotlin, and I would suggest that you don't usually. So from that perspective, you don't really run into that issue. On the flip side, on the Android side, it isn't cross-platform. So you just never have that problem. And that's sort of like really why we're focused on it. Nice. Um, so maybe the activity one was a bad example because any cross-platform still runs in an activity. But uh, for example, in like um, React Native or Flutter, um, how, do they, how fast do they expose these new Android APIs that come in? So I, I would say, depending on the framework, it, you, you often have the tools to do it yourself. So for example, at Airbnb, we built a geofencing API. Now, in doing that, it introduces some challenges. Because if you're just going native, you could have each engineer write it using the APIs directly. But if you want to expose it to a feature in React Native, you have to do a couple things first. You first have to bridge the code. But in doing so, you have to actually decide how to understand the APIs on Android and iOS, and then bridge them in a way that feels canonical in React as well. And so you have to do several steps before you can actually write your feature. And so in some cases, Facebook will, react, will add support, but uh, if you need to do something, you can generally just wrap it. Or take Lottie, for example. So Lottie has an Android and iOS renderer. We were able to get a Lottie React Native library working just by wrapping the native view, and then passing the play, pause, and uh, whatever calls we needed across the bridge. So it generally, because it is native, it's a native view hierarchy, and you have access to native whenever you need, you can add any functionality that you need. I see. I think Flutter does the same with yeah, the channels, same. right? Um, for channels, so, so channels is like you can um, communicate with Android and iOS code. So like you can have, uh, in your code base, you have Android and iOS code, and then you have your, your Dart code. Mm. So if you like have, need specific functionality for um, either platforms, you can do that. You can call them directly. Yeah. What about Xamarin? Can you call that directly? Um... Uh, I have to admit, I have not experienced, like I have no experience in calling that. I know that Xamarin, for example, works with like Android NDK. Uh, but like, if you want to call specific API methods, I am not too sure about it. Got it. Okay. Is it possible to wrap native views in Flutter? Like, if you had, for example, like Lottie or Maps or something, could you just wrap it? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think yeah. it's a no. Yeah. I think it's a no as well, but I wanted to confirm. Well, there, okay. So there was a preview that came out, I guess, very recently, like within the last few days, that said something about iOS being able to something with native views, but it was like. It didn't make sense because it's in like an OpenGL surface and changing to metal whenever that goes away. And that was one of the things, like you couldn't show web content inside of a Flutter view. Yeah. Now, yeah. That was it. Yeah. You know, that's a whole yeah. longer discussion. Yeah, for the, those of you who aren't aware of sort of the architecture of the view system on Flutter versus React Native, 
on React Native, you React reconciles your view, and it uses Flexbox, which is a layout engine that is used in CSS, serializes it over the bridge to a, a Yoga, which is a C++ library, which then takes that uh, Flexbox code and turns it into what's kind of like an absolute layout. It then sends it to iOS or Android, whichever platform it's on, which renders, uh, on Android's case, an absolute layout, a flat view hierarchy with just absolutely positioned views around it. Whereas Flutter, because it owns the entire view system, it actually it goes to Skia, which is a graphics backend directly, and it makes those graphics calls itself. And so while the advantage on React Native is that you are dealing with native views, you can wrap things, you can use whatever you want, um, but you're gonna ex sometimes encounter slight platform differences. So at Airbnb, we have custom fonts, and there were some bugs earlier on in React Native such that the actual alignment of text that Yoga spit out was slightly off. And so we had to do some weird hacky things where we had to do uh, m like magic number paddings on certain text views. Uh, that was also dependent on the font and the size of the font and a number of other things just to make it look the same across Android and iOS. Whereas on the Flutter side, if you have a widget, it's gonna make all those Skia calls directly. So although you can't wrap a native view, it's gonna look exactly the same. So um, I know that usually when you try to use a new framework, a new tech, it never goes exactly like the tutorial or like you would expect. There's, some, there's always something that, that blocks you along the way that um, just is not, uh, you, you did, really didn't expect. Do you guys have any war stories like that? Something that came up that you were a bit like WTF on those platforms? Uh, well, again, like Kotlin Native just got passed to like 1.0 beta. Yeah, so you're the pioneer. And um, thank you, by the way, Kevin, yeah, for doing all this work for so us. So it's been six months. For everybody that gets into it, the one thing that is going to be a culture shock and, and might actually be a major problem, we'll see, is that they're doing a whole different thing with state and threading. So you can't just do pass your state among threads. You can't reference it from among threads, all this stuff. So I went through what I'm seeing people go through now, which is like the stages of grief where they're in denial and they're trying to like cheat the Kotlin native runtime to trick it and then losing hard and then like just understanding how things work. So for everybody, that's the thing. But compound that by six months ago, you know, it barely compiled and there were no tools. Um, that was awful. <laughs> now it's, it's not so bad now. Mm. All right. I've got a few. Okay. All right. So. Uh, one of our engineers was building uh, a screen in which there was some sort of monetary value that was supposed to be formatted, right? And it turns out that JavaScript core has uh, like a currency formatter, and so you spit in a number and it, pa it gives you back the comma-separated string. So uh, we shipped it on both platforms, only to later discover that only iOS was comma-separated. What? Yeah. It was a little strange. You're just calling a function, seemed to work on one, didn't work on the other. And this is what I'm talking about with that last few percent that can be really challenging. So we tracked it down and we figured it out. It turns out that the JavaScript core that ships with React Native on Android specifically doesn't have some of these, some of the, the function that we needed, which is part of like the internationalization, some sort of text package. That's an optional flag that you can compile into the JavaScript core. It wasn't included because it it's like three megabytes or something like that. Uh, so they just left it out. But it silent fa uh, failed silently. Uh, it turns, so then it turned out we had to like figure out our own thing, make another library, and figure out what was going on there. Which brings up the kind of the point is like here you have the same thing and you have like something randomly going wrong and it turns out to be some like missing compiler flag from the JavaScript core that's included. Another thing to note is you have to kind of understand there's all these nuances to the architecture of React Native that kind of bubble up and matter sometimes. So another one is the fact that you are bundling JavaScript core with React Native on Android. And that's the difference. So on iOS, iOS actually has a JavaScript core that ships with iOS and you just tap into that. And so all iOS devices are gonna be the same, but it could depend iOS version to iOS version. On the Android side of things, Android doesn't actually ship with a JavaScript core out of the box. So you have to package it with your app. That also means that the app size overhead is a little bit larger on Android, but it also means that you're packaging it and you have some controls and there are gonna be differences between your app and what, are, what some other options are. 
So we had situations where you know there's a version of uh, JavaScript core that ships with uh, React Native out of the box. Facebook does not use that. They have their own that they've done like two years of tweaks on top of, but they don't open source that. Then there's another a repo where they basically periodically take WebKit and then they create React Native compatible JavaScript cores out of it, and you can like choose to randomly like upgrade to them. But then you have like all these little micro decisions to make, and it's like not really clear what the pros and cons are, or like what the implications are on app size or performance or different devices. So it gets really complicated. Jesus. And, and, and I thought my bugs were easy. Well, I don't really have war stories for Flutter since I just recently started exploring it. Um, but like one of the challenges I faced um, with learning Flutter was wrapping my head around um, how to build a Flutter app from an Android developer's perspective. So like I'm used to having an activity, um, activity lifecycle, a fragment, but then all those things are not in Flutterland. It's just, oh, your app is a widget your UI as a widget, and then you just build your your entire UI as a tree of widgets. So um, that was like one thing that I had to like think about um, differently from Android that, um, okay, why is my app a widget, and why is my UI a widget? Why is padding a widget? Why is it that when I need to center this text, the center thing is a widget, and I have to wrap my, my, um, my text um, with the center widget, so that was kind of weird, but <laughs> like you're you you get used to it, and then you start working with it. Um, another thing is like because Flutter is um, actively getting developed, um, sometimes you can upgrade um, your SDK, and then your um, project doesn't compile again for like some weird reason. And usually, you can Google and find like somebody has already created the issue on um, the Flutter or GitHub repository, but like you run into issues like that. I have a few more stories, but just so I can get a sense, who was at my talk earlier today? Just so I don't bore you. Okay, about half. Okay, good to know for stories. <laughs> um, by the way, from uh, on the the Dart land, that Dart scares me personally. I'm like, it seems it's a new language. Um, it seems close enough, but not exactly the same as kind of a normal um, Java. Uh, did you have any issues um, kind of learning it and be productive with it? Um, not really, but the first time I saw it, I thought it was strange. I like weird. Like, why would you? Why did they decide to use um, Dart for um, Flutter and not Kotlin? And Kotlin looks really pretty, really pretty and I Dart wish. doesn't really <laughs> doesn't really look that pretty. But um, I, yeah, it's it kind of is similar to Java. So if you're familiar with Java or C Sharp, you you you'll be able to pick it up. Um, and then um, it's a little less verbose than Java, so that's I guess one of a plus for yeah. it. We're uh, we're gonna work on a Kotlin multi-platform Flutter channel implementation, uh, and Jesus it's called Christ. it's called Clutter. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only reason we're gonna work on it because I want that name with a K, of course. I mean, okay. it is it is my belief that any big corporation like Microsoft or Google has to promote at least two different programming languages at any given point in time. <laughs> so you're working on um, Sunset Xamarin right now. So what happened? Why are you, why are you changing minds? I think it should be clear that you're working on sunsetting a, a Xamarin application, not Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> my bad. I, w I, I went a little bit ahead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just in case that wasn't clear from my yeah. Um No, so like, um, like I can give you like a bit of historical background on that. It's like uh, I used to work for Hockey App, and we had an Android application that was written in Java, and we had never had that on the Play Store. Uh, one of the uh, I have like concerns that we had is that we would get rejected or like would we would have problems because technically at the core, like for some people who look at it like that, uh, that is just another app store on an app store. And some people don't like that in certain companies. Um, and uh, so we didn't release that to the Play Store. And then uh, we became App Center, like the new generation of Hockey App. And we said, OK, we need to have an app, and we want to have that on the Play Store. And so like, higher, like organizationally, we were part of the Xamarin organization. And so we said, you know, like we want to have an iOS application, we want to have an Android application, and maybe down the road we want to have a Windows application. So Xamarin is perfect for that. And uh, so uh, a couple of uh, uh, our team worked on that and uh, built that uh, Xamarin-based iOS and Android application. 
uh, the AIOS application never saw the light of day because of uh, the concerns that uh, a certain company has about publishing apps on an app store that are an app store. Um, and so we ended up in this weird situation where we have an Android version on the Play Store, we don't have an iOS version on the App Store. And so the, and like looking forward, at least from what I'm seeing right now, we won't have a Windows version at least very, very soon. Um, and so, uh, so this like entire like cross-platform argument kind of became void. Uh, and uh, I, recently we made an announcement and we wanted to have like a, a release, a new version of the app to the Play Store. And so like we have like, a couple of different channels that we thought were easier to serve with like product flavors on uh, a native like Java, like Groovy based or Gradle based application. Uh, and so we just went about with that because we still had that previous code base which was functioning well and was loved by users while as our Xamarin app was not really met with like raving the reviews in the Play Store which is not exactly a problem with Xamarin I have to say. Like all the, like we've gone through like all the reviews and all of them are basically about like issues that were not about Xamarin in that sense. Uh, so like it was most, mostly a thing of like also like resourcing, finding the right people, like defining the future set of that. We, we also want to make sure we are able to like open source this application maybe at some point in the future. And so that just seemed to be the like right idea at the time. Okay. Um, I want to open it up a little bit to you guys too. Uh, I want to hear your questions that you have for the audience. I see already some hands over there. What framework has the smallest um, footprint on your APKs? Um, uh, whatever the Kotlin footprint is. That seems reasonable to me. Yeah, iOS is a different story. It's a, it's like a couple, two, three megs, something like that. Hmm. Yeah, I had some exact numbers in the React Native blog post, so you're, you can double check that, but it's a little bit bigger on Android than iOS because of that JavaScript core. Uh, you're talking in the order of like three to five megabytes, I believe, but I would double check there. Um, for Flutter, I'm not sure about the size of the um, iOS application, but um, the Android um, for like a Hello World app, app on Android built with Flutter is um, at least four megs, so that's a lot. Damn. Have you guys seen APK Golf? This is an amazing blog post. Some guy, you know, golf, the, the goal is to keep your score down. Some guy wanted to see how small of an APK he could make, and I think he got it down to like, 180 bytes or something like that. He's wow. here? Is he in this room right now? It's, it's amazing. Apparently you can ha make like a public static void main on, in an Android app, in an APK. It's crazy. You should check it out, APK Golf. It's very cool. I, I would download that. I, f I feel like we should talk I, to him because I, like, I, from my experience, it is very hard to get a, a Xamarin-based uh, APK bundle at least like under 10 megabytes because of the shared mono runtime. Wow, okay. Damn. Any other question? Go ahead. Oh, that's a great one. How's the accessibility support for each platform? Um, well, I guess if you're doing the UI's native, it's kind of whatever the, the story is native, so. Yeah. So it, it used to be really bad in React Native. We did a big push last year for accessibility, and we, we actually maintained our own fork of React Native at Airbnb. And so there was like a simultaneous effort in which Facebook and other people were cont contributing some of the bridging of all the accessibility APIs, but we did add a number of additions on our fork explicitly for it. I think it's better now. These, this was over a year ago, and I know that they put more effort into it. So I would check back. Uh, I think it's, it's pretty decent on React Native now. For Flutter, I'm not sure. So I haven't actually looked into accessibility, so I, I can't really answer that. Uh, for Xamarin, I my, like I might remember that it also has accessibility support based on like the UI uh, components that you're using. Uh, so it basically depends on whether you're using Xamarin Native or Xamarin Forms, um, but it would be a miss uh, to make any concrete promises there. Cool. Um, last question and then we're gonna wrap it up. Yeah, so the question is on localization support. How does that work? Um, yeah, this is one of those things that like uh, there's a serious lack of library support, and so anything you're going to do is going to have to be in, in the native environment, so you're going to be doing extra work, uh, absolutely. Hmm. So we did quite a bit of work to build this in-house. I don't know what the out-of-the-box experience looks like, but we, we built a library in which you like had a, a named string as well as like parameters and the default string, uh, and then it would actually 
go into our Android and iOS pipelines and then turn back into strings.xml that would kind of get imported and, and put in at build time. So we did a lot of in-house work for it. I don't actually know how good it is out of the box. Um, for Flutter, I'm not sure of um, localization support, but I assume that it's good because I saw some articles about it, um, but I haven't really implemented it. Uh, I haven't touched up on like localization in the app project that much, but as far as I know, it's pretty much comparable to what you get in like either iOS or Android native. But it is a consideration if you're trying to integrate one of these platforms into an existing app, especially if you have like some tool chains that like automatically go to CI, maybe upload to internationalization server, and like bring it back down, integrate it. These are additional things that you're going to have to consider and overhead and things to maintain if you integrate it into your app.